Good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, it's a pleasure to have everyone here today. My name is Obiano Drew and I work with AKFC as the events officer uh, for our public engagement team. Just before we get started, I would like to go over just a few housekeeping rules and then we'll do a very quick icebreaker, just sort of get everyone warm and settled into the, into the room, both virtually and in person before we start today session. Um, I would first like to say that for those watching virtually, um, if you can spotlight um, the AKFC channel or the speaker view to get the, I guess, the maximal experience from, the, from a virtual perspective, that would be great. Also, um, just want to note that this event will be recorded, so that's just something to keep in mind. However, when we do go out into the breakout sessions coming up later in today's event, um, that will not be recorded. Also, there are washrooms available, and you can see uh, myself or one of the ushers outside to help you uh, locate where the washroom is. Also, um, all of the presentations will be happening in English. However, if you do need um, French interpretation for those in person, for those in person, um, once you grab your your mics and sorry this and then your headsets from outside all you have to do is to connect your headset into um, this device and then if you go to channel one so there's a button on the side that specifies what channels there are so channel one is for english and then channel two is for French, and then channel zero is just what's happening on the main floor, which you wouldn't need. <laughs> but then for those who are tuning in online, you can also select um, on your Zoom which interpretation you would like, either French or English, depending on your preference. And just before we continue for today's event, uh, we would like to do a quick icebreaker. So those in person, those online, if you can please just bring out your device, uh, you can go to menti.com. Uh, for those in, in online, the, the link will also be put in the chat with the code as well. So if you can just go to menti.com, the code is on the screen, but I can also read it out. It's 28770135. So if you go to menti.com and go to the code 28770135. So um, we're just gonna give a few minutes to have people um, start joining the menti.com. And once you've joined, you'll see the first question that's going to be on your screen asking you what sector are you working in? So it's menti.com, the code is 28770135. If you also look on your screen, you should, you should be able to see the code on your screen as well. So yeah, I'm just seeing um, some of the answers coming in. I see gender equality nice and large, which is um, very on brand for today's event. Um, and I also see that people coming in from different sectors, education, health, climate, finance. So it's really great to have everyone from across the board joining today's session. And then we can just um, transition into the next question um, regarding this mentee session. So we're asking which network is your organization a part of? So it had that be the federal government, C4D, um, the FSPG group, or you belong to another network that is not uh, affiliated with the other three um, represented here on the screen. So I do see that there are quite a number of people um, from C4D and also the FSPG group, but also um, the federal government as well. So it's really great to have everyone um, in today's session. And then we can transition into the next question. So we'd like to know, you know, with regards to today's topic, today's event, what is your experience with gender responsive nature-based climate solutions? How would you say you are in terms of your level of knowledge? Is this new to you? Is it familiar to you? Have you done research on it? Or maybe you have already participated in projects related to gender responsive nature-based climate solutions. So we just like to get a feel of the room, a feel of all of our attendees, all of our guests, um, you know, where you are sitting right now. 
I do see quite a number of people are familiar and also quite a number of people it's also new to you. So we're really hoping that today's session um, can help amplify, elevate, or at least give opportunities to continue to dive further into this topic. And lastly, for today's um, quick icebreaker, we'd like to know what is your organization's experience with gender responsive nature-based climate solutions? Would you say it's a new subject? Would you say there's a level of awareness within your organization? Would you say, okay, we've already planned, we've analyzed, we've already done some projects related to this topic. We've implemented some projects. We already have funding for some of these projects or you're not even sure <laughs> what your organization's stance is with MBCS, so um, that's also fine. We just like to get um, an understanding of where we're all, where we're all at coming into today's conversation and coming into today's session. So once again, it's really nice to have everyone that has joined us, both in person and virtually. And to officially commence today's session, I'm going to welcome Steve Masing, who is the Regional Director for North America for our Programs and Partnerships in Aga Khan Foundation. I'd like to start with a bang. Um, thank you so much, Uju, uh, and, and welcome everyone. Uh, bienvenue à cet événement aujourd'hui. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to this event on gender responsive nature-based solutions. I'd like to start today by paying respect to the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation on whose unceded ancestral lands we gather today. We are grateful for the stewardship of the elders and the, uh, sorry, of the elders and the traditional knowledge keepers past, present and future and we affirm our commitment as individuals and as an organization to the reconciliation process. The name Ottawa comes from the Algonquin word for trade. This recognizes that this location where the three rivers meet has been a place where goods and ideas have been exchanged for, since time immemorial. It is our hope that our discussion today in a small way can continue the centuries old tradition of exchanging ideas and building relationships. I am uh, particularly pleased to be welcoming such a large in-person and virtual audience today to be discussing a topic of such importance and urgency to the world and also to the Aga Khan Foundation. AKF has really put both gender and climate at the center of its work, both organizationally and programmatically. Organizationally, we have made a global commitment to become a net zero organization with the ambition to become carbon negative by 2030. Within our programs, we have really centered gender and climate as core standalone themes and cross-cutting themes across all our work, whether in health, education, ag and food security, or economic inclusion. We know that nature-based solutions that protect, restore, and sustainably use biodiversity and ecosystems hold significant promise in helping people adapt to the adverse impacts of climate change. Nature-based solutions work they are available now, and they are underfunded. So we know that investments in these solutions will have a major positive impact. However, our experiences have also shown that these approaches will not be sustained, nor will they achieve their maximum potential if they are not designed and implemented in an inclusive, bottom-up manner, which fully in takes into account the rights and needs of diverse populations, especially women, who, as we know, are too often bear the brunt of the adverse impacts of climate change. <clears throat> Throughout today's presentations and workshops, we have the chance to examine and reflect on how best to ensure that nature-based solutions are both gender responsive and inclusive. I am particularly pleased to be co-organizing this event with two entities that are leading on the thinking about and the funding of nature-based solutions, the International Institute for Sustainable Development and Global Affairs Canada. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Global Affairs Canada's brand new director. She told me that she's been on the job for five weeks uh, for Climate Finance Partnerships, Celine Heimbecker. Hello, bonjour. 
Um, that feels too tall. I'm a bit shorter than everybody else that I work with. Um, so my name is Celine Heinbecker. I've just joined the Climate Finance Partnerships team at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, I'm in the, I've been in the job just over a month, uh, so I am on a learning curve and I was encouraged to see some of the results there. I think I'm on this learning curve with a few, few people in the room and, and on, on the screen. Uh, this is my first in-person event uh, since 2018, actually, because I went on mat leave, then the pandemic happened, so this is blowing my mind <laughs> to be here with all of you. Um, thank you to our hosts for organizing this virtual uh, and a hybrid event. It's hard to do that kind of thing, so thank you for everybody who worked on the logistics for this. Um, and I uh, want to recognize that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg Nation, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, so I'm new to the climate finance team. Uh, I'm stepping into the very big shoes of Tina Guthrie, for those of you who would have worked with her before. She's now on posting. Um, and I feel very lucky to be working with Carrie and Florence and a couple of colleagues who I think are online on this file. I was uh, joking to somebody um, in the networking session before that um, I worry all day and all night about climate change. And I finally have a job where I can work on, on it during the day. Uh, I have a four-year-old daughter, and I think this is the most important subject for all of us to be working on, so I'm really excited to be among you and to be learning um, with all of you. So my job is to provide a big picture context for, uh, for the climate finance commitment of the government. And so uh, if the slides will come up, I think, am I, yes, there we go. So we can go to the next, next one. And uh, I'm going to go through a quick history of, uh, if you could go again, actually, sorry, it's, we've got English and French um, consecutive, so we'll, yeah, that's great. Um, so I'll go through a quick evolution of the climate finance commitments of the government. So, and this is going to go from 2010 to 2026. So we're going to start with some history and then bring you up to where we are now. Um, the Fast Start portfolio was uh, 1.2 billion um, that you see there on, on the end of the, of the slide. And that was a commitment made in the context of COP15 in 2009 as part of the effort to jointly mobilize 100 million in climate finance annually by 2020. 70% of that went to mitigation efforts and 30% to adaptation. And then in 2015, uh, another commitment was made, and that was in the context of uh, COP21 uh, in support of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. And that was 2.6 billion. And um, you can see there what the, the uh, proportions were. Oh, that's easier, thank you. Just, okay. So I'll keep it there. Um, and then uh, fast forward to what we're talking about now, uh, the Prime Minister made an announcement to double our climate finance commitment to 5.3 billion in 2021. Uh, Canada joined the G7 2030 Nature Compact that year, so, so that's what that, that uh, commitment is. It's, sorry, it's a little bit tucked down at the bottom of the slide uh, for those of you in the room. Um, so this money aims to reduce global GHG emissions, help developing countries transition to low carbon economies. Uh, it's aiming to help the poorest and most vulnerable communities build resilience to the effects of climate change. And uh, we're trying to apply a nature positive screen to all of our programming. Uh, we want to have positive environmental and biodiversity outcomes. Um, and we, we aim to achieve biodiversity co-benefits across all thematic areas. So I think everybody in the room agrees that there's a lot of ambition in, in what we're trying to do. And now I will skip ahead to there. Um, Affaires Mondiales Canada examine attentivement non seulement l'intersection des droits des femmes et et de l'adaptation au changement climatique, mais également la valeur d'une approche intersectionnelle féministe et fondée sur les droits en matière de financement climatique. Nous savons que les femmes travaillent traditionnellement dans des secteurs sensibles au climat, notamment l'agriculture, la santé, les écosystèmes et la foresterie. Il existe donc des possibilités de renforcer le leadership des femmes dans l'action climatique 
en appuyant des organisations dirigées par des femmes qui travaillent déjà dans ces domaines. Dans le cadre de notre engagement actuel en matière de financement climatique, les projets du Canada chercheront à s'aligner sur la politique d'aide internationale féministe, et en particulier le domaine d'action 4, l'environnement et l'action climatique. And so here what you have is a, a breakdown of the, the organization of the 5.3 billion commitment that goes from 2021 to 2026. Um, this builds on lessons learned from the previous iterations of the climate finance commitments. Um, and this was a centerpiece of our, of our um, engagement in COP26. So you see uh, the thematic areas are clean energy transition and coal phase out climate smart agriculture and food systems, nature-based solutions and biodiversity, and climate governance. And uh, a little bit low in the lower uh, um, end there, you'd see that we have 40% um, of the funding is for grants and contributions and 60% for unconditionally repayable contributions. Um, For, in terms of the policy parameters, 40% uh, allocation of funding goes towards climate adaptation. There's a minimum target of at least 80% of projects that should integrate gender equality considerations, and 20% of the envelope will support nature-based solutions and projects with biodiversity co-benefits. There we go. So this, this is a, a very useful slide that we will make sure that you have on your own. It's a bit, we recognize it's a bit dense um, for, for the presentation's sake, but when you, when you have it, it'll, it'll, hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Um, this is where I'm going to talk about what our team in particular is responsible for. So within the 5.3 billion, uh, there, there's a, an envelope of 315 million that's been allocated to what we call partnering for climate. Um, and the goal of that envelope is to fund projects from indigenous uh, peoples, uh, civil society, other organizations in Canada to support climate change adaptation in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, so we've divided uh, that amount. There's 300 million um, focused on sub-Saharan Africa and there's a 15 million um, envelope to work with indigenous peoples in Canada and fostering partnerships for them with indigenous peoples in developing countries to work on their climate priorities. Um, for those of you who might be following that, there, uh, there will be a call for proposals uh, coming up on the indigenous component. And I would just ask you to stay tuned. We're working very hard to, to get, that, get that out. Um, within the Partnering for Climate funding, uh, in addition to all the projects integrating gender equality, at least $20 million of the $300 million will be allocated, uh, will focus on advancing women's rights and climate change adaptation. Um, and the projects uh, will involve women's organizations in developing countries. Um, so the types of things that, that this could involve would be promoting women's economic empowerment in nature-based solutions, um, supporting women's meaningful participation in climate resilience policy and decision-making, empowering women in the design, implementation, and scale-up of climate change adaptation, um, uh, nature-based solutions. And I think, let's see, I'll put that in French. And there we go. So, um, there we go. Um, donc, un, un petit euh, euh, état des lieux sur les, les propositions, les, con les notes conceptuelles qu'on a déjà reçues sous euh, ce programme. Euh, pour tirer parti de l'expertise de, la de la mobilisation des organisations au Canada dans l'action pour le climat, euh, on a alloué 315 millions de dollars pour cette initiative. Um, oh, sorry, I'm repeating myself in French. I'll do it anyway. Um, tous les projets intègrent l'égalité des sexes et au moins 20 millions de dollars sur les 300 millions seront consacrés à la promotion des droits des femmes et de l'adaptation au changement climatique. Ces projets impliqueront des organisations de femmes dans les pays en développement. Um, so, what we have found in our, uh, in the concept notes that have come so far, 
is um, that there, there were 67 unique concept notes received, about half focused on gender transformative action through nature-based solutions, and 20 specifically targeted the intersection of women's rights and climate adaptation. Common areas of focus included securing women's land tenure and access to resources, promoting women's voice and leadership at all levels, uh, from households to community to state level decision making, improving access for women to the knowledge and capacities needed to integrate nature-based solutions into their climate adaptation actions. And we also saw some uh, concepts that looked at the links between gender-based violence and climate-related stresses and emergencies. Um, and so my presentation ends there. We're still in the process of reviewing proposals and we will have news uh, and share information with, with everyone uh, in, in due course. Thank you very much, Celine, for that uh, presentation and for framing, and uh, you know, to Steve as well for, for that great overall um, introduction to the session. Uh, my name is Veronica Lowe. I am a senior policy advisor with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD. And we're really thrilled to be here today as uh, co-organizers of this event. So today, what I'll just be doing is providing a few highlights from the Nature for Climate Adaptation Initiative, which is partly what brings us here. Um, if I could just bring up the slides, uh, please, for my presentation. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so just to provide a few highlights, uh, which uh, provides, sets a scene, I guess, for the rest of the, of the session as well. We'll be, we'll be hearing a second part of case studies um, and presentations on implementing nature-based climate solutions um, that are gender responsive and equitable. So the objectives of the NCAI are for enhancing the knowledge and capacity of organizations to implement nature-based climate solutions for adaptation. And the impetus uh, for this initiative that's been uh, supported by Global Affairs Canada through the Partnering for Climate Envelope that Celine has just described um, is that we know that there's growing, growing global momentum for uh, policy momentum for implementing nature-based climate solutions. But there are concerns about whether they're being um, implemented in inclusive and equitable, equitable ways, um, and whether or not they are truly resulting um, in good outcomes for biodiversity and for ecosystem integrity, and whether they're um, implemented in gender responsive ways as well. So the core objectives of the NCAI are to provide um, capacity building and knowledge um, support for organizations that are implementing NBCS uh, that are socially inclusive, that are gender responsive, but also critically um, enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services as well. And what we're offering are three main kinds of tools and resources um, to help and uh, build support for knowledge and skills and um, capacity building. And that includes a flexible, self-paced EBA e-learning course, uh, a resource library that um, contains uh, documents and guidance notes on implementing nature-based climate solutions, and also networking events um, such as this one uh, where we're here today. So we're pleased to, to really participate and engage with you for the rest of the day here. Uh, here's a quick look at our learning platform, and um, this is where all of our tools and resources are hosted. The website is ncai.iisd.org. And just a quick look at our resource library. Uh, we have guidance documents, policy briefs, and case studies, as well as knowledge products that are developed um, from IISD, but also um, those that have been developed for the larger, uh, larger global community of practice on nature-based solutions. And just recently, earlier this year, uh, we've provided a screenshot here, but it's a guidance note that we developed uh, that helps to really provide some clarity on uh, the terminology behind nature-based climate solutions and some of the controversies uh, that are surrounding the issue, um, as well as detailing the need for inclusive and rights-based approaches for implementing um, um, nature-based climate solutions. And just a brief overview of some of the webinars and events. So in, in addition to this one today, uh, we also convened an NBCS 101 webinar earlier this year. And we had the pleasure of partnering with the Canadian Coalition for Climate Change and Development. 
and the Food Security Policy Group networks. Um, and this has been recorded and is available uh, on, our, on our website. And we'll also have the opportunity to engage internationally um, at the upcoming climate change and biodiversity meetings um, in Egypt and in Montreal later this year, where we're also hoping to interface and hear from um, other practitioners and organizations that have been involved in nature-based climate solutions implementation. And next year, just to give you um, a bit of a preview, we're, we'll also be hosting some webinars as well, um, focusing in um, exactly on these rights-based and inclusive approaches as well. So I'll just give you a quick tour of our e-learning course that's focused on implementing ecosystem-based adaptation. And we have the pleasure of announcing that it's just been launched earlier this week. Uh, we've developed this together with our partners uh, from GIZ and from IUCN, and it's supported by the governments of Canada and Germany as well. And what it is is really a, um, a self-placed and flexible resource that you can access and register for at any time and um, access the resources that are really most relevant to you at the speed um, and the pace that, that you need. And it's hosted by SDG Academy on the edX platform. And the registration link is on the website that I mentioned earlier. And um, this, you know, this course is uh, really has been um, launched j just, just on Tuesday and what, we already have more than 2,000 registrants. So I just provide a quick overview of the, of the syllabus. Uh, what we're offering is some detailed um, guidance on the implementation steps for ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, anything from climate risk assessments to um, looking at different valuation techniques and also monitoring and evaluation. And in addition, we have cross-cutting insight units that focus on the themes uh, that are cross-cutting, such as governance, uh, gender, traditional knowledge, um, and also in enhancing those biodiversity co-benefits, as well as trying to reach across different sectors and enhance upscaling of um, ecosystem-based approaches, for example, in the water sector, in urban areas. And uh, with regard and relevant to the theme for today's event, we also have a dedicated insight module that's focused on um, EBA and uh, gender insights. And the learning objectives are on um, understanding what gender responsive EBA looks like in practice and also how to integrate uh, gender responsive approaches that are based on the elements of understanding gender differences and adaptation needs and capacities on ensuring uh, participation and influence in adaptation decision making are gender specific and also in promoting gender equitable access to finance and other benefits um, from investments in adaptation. So what I'd like to do is to play a quick video for you now to preview uh, what we offer in the other modules in the course. So if we could play the video now, that would be great. Multiple strategies to adapt in ways that are locally appropriate, cost-effective, and diverse the loss of biodiversity to climate change. The EBA e-learning course equips you with transferable skills on the design and the implementation of EBA actions. It is brought to you by a variety of experts and practitioners from a global community of practice, integrating on-the-ground experiences and best practice gained from over a decade of implementation. You will also have the option to earn a certificate, which will help you to gain credibility in an increasingly important field. This e-learning course is self-paced, which means that you can take the course at your own speed. There are nine units in total, with video lectures, handouts, and suggestions on relevant reading materials. The six core units have quizzes and accompanying case studies that showcase how EBA has been implemented around the globe. Our journey starts off with Unit 2, an introduction to EBA, during which you'll learn about the basic elements of EBA and learn how to distinguish EBA from similar approaches. You'll also hear about a case study on climate adaptation in coastal wetlands in the Gulf of Mexico. Unit 3 introduces the framework for the planning, implementation, and mainstreaming of EBA projects. Cross-cutting topics such as gender, governance, climate justice, local and indigenous knowledge, as well as communications are highlighted throughout the unit. You will also get to know the Harry Oban project, which focuses on building climate resilience in the Terai Arc and Chitwan Annapurna landscapes of Nepal. 
In Unit 4, you learn about climate risk assessments, including the development of a climate change impact chain, identification of risk components, and development of suitable indicators. The case study for this unit presents an example of flood risk assessment and EBA in the Lower Mono River Basin in Togo and Benin. Unit 5 focuses on the valuation processes of EBA, explaining benefits, costs, and impacts. You'll be introduced to a cost-benefit analysis that was used to prioritize EBA actions on Tana Island, Vanuatu. In the sixth unit, we translate theory into practice and focus on the implementation of EBA. You'll learn about stakeholder analysis and the importance of aligning EBA with policies. You'll also get an overview of how EBA actions can address different climate hazards across different ecosystems. A case study on land restoration in Inner Mongolia runs off this unit. In Unit 7, you will be guided through a four-step process for monitoring and evaluating EBA projects, including the development of a theory of change and indicators. You will also learn about monitoring and evaluation practices in South Africa. Common traits through this course are rate-based approach to EBA that are socially inclusive, promote gender equity, respect traditional knowledge, and that natural positive. This cross-cutting overarching teams receive special attention in four inside modules in Unit 8. Finally, a crucial objective is to mainstream EBA into other sectors, policies and tools beyond the environmental conservation movement. Three optional modules in Unit 9 examine EBA in the agricultural and the water sector, as well as in urban areas. EBA is the conservation, restoration, and sustainable use of biodiversity and ecosystems as part of an overall strategy to help people adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. Despite the growing policy momentum for EBA, capacity development is still needed to scale up EBA and ensure that it's relevant, effective, and locally accepted and used by communities. This wraps up our course overview. We hope you're as excited as we are to go on this EBA learning journey together. Let's get started. I hope you enjoyed that exclusive preview and that sparked some interest and that you can spread the word through your networks and also that you're encouraged to register yourself as well. Um, so if there are any questions, I had a last slide that with some contact information, but I think um, you know, we can network and, uh, and you'll find a way to, to contact us if you have any questions, I'm sure. Um, so that concludes my presentation, um, but what I'd like to do, this being a hybrid event, I'm going to hand over to a virtual person right now. Uh, to Anya Knechtel with the um, AKFC, and she will take you through a brief overview of session two, uh, sorry, not session two, but part two of session one, uh, where we can you know, get more interactive, uh, hear about the case studies, and have some breakout uh, sessions and discussions. So there's Anya, welcome. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, yes, my name is Anya Knechtel, and I am supporting the Aga Khan Foundation on the Climate Resilience and Adaptation Speaker Series. I'm joining you today from traditional Treaty 7 territory, which is the sacred lands of the Stony Nakoda, which is comprised of the Bearspaw, Bear's Chiniki, and Wesley First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is comprised of the Sika, Pakani, and Kanai. Um, and I'm very pleased to be joining you today uh, just to review some of the um, components of a gender responsive approach within the context of uh, nature-based climate solutions. Next slide, please. And sorry, I don't know if my slide presentation has actually been put up on. Uh... Thank you. Um, so climate related events in the last few months alone uh, from the punishing droughts in the Horn of Africa devastating flooding in Pakistan and supercharged typhoons and hurricanes speak to the amplification of the climate, climate crisis. And the impacts of these events also highlight that climate change serves as a threat multiplier. In addition to intensifying challenges such as biodiversity decline and water scarcity, 
It is also fueling resource-related conflicts, hunger, migration, increased gender-based violence, and more. Unfortunately, persistent gender inequalities mean that women and gender diverse people are experiencing a heightened vulnerability to climate-related risks and other crises. Additional factors such as discrimina of discrimination, sorry, such as indigeneity, race, age, and ability also intensify vulnerability and reduce options available to people to realize rights and sustain their livelihoods and well-being. As we are discussing in this session, nature-based climate solutions offer an opportunity for people to realize rights, protect ecosystems, and build their resilience to climate and interrelated crises. Yet, for this to hold true across communities, adopting a gender-responsive approach to these initiatives is critical. Next slide, please. If we look at the range of possible approaches, we see a progression towards rights-based approaches that address gender and social inequities. Obviously, initiatives that build off misguided concepts that women are inherently vulnerable or only capable of certain roles can increase vulnerability by further concentrating resources among advantaged groups and therefore can be seen as gender discriminatory. Gender-blind initiatives, however, may arise from an inadequate or an incomplete understanding of gender differentiated roles and responsibilities. For example, uh, a project that diverts water to parched farmlands, but overlooks the additional time and effort that this causes for women who may bear the responsibility for collecting household water. And that this also uh, further limits their ability to engage in other activities such as water management. And we see that while well, gender sensitive approaches identify and recognize gender roles and impacts, an action-oriented approach to addressing these inequities and gaps is imperative. An example of a gender-responsive approach where these actions are realized would be where women are co-designers of resource management plans and equal partners in implementing solutions so that the location, the purpose, and the scale of projects address women's rights and needs and are therefore more likely to benefit everyone. If an initiative is able, these actions can move into the realm of gender transformative approaches that address the root causes of structural inequalities. For example, through policy changes, women may gain representation um, in further levels of regional or national level water management strategies that also can help to address inequities in access to and control over resources. Next slide, please. Key characteristics of gender responsive approaches are that the approach is intersectional. So it supports an understanding of how intersecting factors of identity, as well as historical, social, and political contexts contribute to different forms of discrimination and affect resilience to climate change. It's also rights-based and action-oriented, which means it's actively addressing gender inequalities and unrealized rights. And it has this transformative potential while not every initiative will result in gender transformation, it is supporting that effort to address the root causes of inequality that can bring about structural changes that advance equality and rights. Next slide, please. So to undertake a gender responsive approach in the context of nature-based climate solutions, we need to be aware of the gaps and inequities that persist. Obviously, gendered roles and responsibility, which are socially constructed and importantly can change over time, give rise to many related inequalities, as well as shaping access to and control over resources, as well as education, information, legal rights, mobility, and more. So building off of this, we recognize that gender differences in access and control over resources may be an issue, and this can be affected by direct and indirect factors, such as limited legal tenure over land or resources, as well as things like care responsibilities that may leave little time for engaging in planning processes. There may also be imbalances in decision-making power with women and marginalized groups often being excluded or underrepresented in governance and resource management structures. Barriers to participation may include illiteracy, lack of awareness of laws and policies, and again, care responsibilities. Um, but there can also be 
disparities in how gender specific knowledge that is linked to gender based roles is valued in decision making or in ecosystem management. And that exclusion can lead to gender blind decisions that fail to recognize and address women's needs or increase workloads. So this in turn can result in inequalities in the distribution of benefits from initiatives, which may reinforce or worsen disparities, leading to heightened vulnerabilities among marginalized groups. Next slide, please. Well, the upcoming case studies are going to provide better examples of how gender responsive approaches are being applied. I think it's helpful to identify some general approaches that can contribute to gender um, equity and social inclusion. Um, if we think through the project cycle right from the beginning, we need to see planning that's informed by participatory processes that actively engage underrepresented voices and inform gender-based assessments. And this, as a result, needs to be context-specific analysis to provide an understanding of the gender dynamics of a particular community and avoid generalizations that may not hold true for the initiatives that you're helping to implement. Um, moving in to the planning phase and to looking at actions that actually address gender-specific needs and capacities. So this is this action-oriented component um, and likewise, ensuring that there's gender equitable and inclusive structures that support the implementation and ongoing governance of nature-based climate solutions. And throughout the project cycle, it's also very important, as we'll be discussing in our, in our breakout groups, that the collection of gender disaggregated data um, is occurring to help contribute to future planning and understanding of gender differentiated outcomes and what could be improved. And to aid in this, participatory monitoring and evaluation systems can track the distribution of nature-based climate solution benefits among stakeholders and also inform future planning. Next slide, please. When we therefore consider the benefits of a gender responsive approach uh, to nature-based climate solutions, we can really see that they're multi multifaceted um, and stemming from what has just been discussed, we can see benefits such as increases in the effectiveness and sustainability of outcomes, more inclusive governance and management structures, increases in the equity and the distribution of benefits, and also more broadly, that these gender responsive nature-based climate initiatives can actually um, achieve synergies with other objectives such as improved uh, food security, reduction in gender-based violence as a more um, gender-inclusive approach is adopted. And through this, ultimately, we can strengthen resilience across the community. I think we'll all agree that the case studies that we're about to see really highlight how these um, different principles can be carried out and played out um, under different contexts. And when we talk about gender responsive approaches, um, it's intentionally approaches because there is no one size fits all approach to a project. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce our case study speakers. If I could have the next slide, please. So our speakers today are Humara Daniel, who is a climate resilience spe specialist for Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan. And Humara has experience in bridging the nexus of development and interdisciplinary research with a focus on natural re resource management issues faced by border areas and remote mountain ecosystems of fragile states in Central Asia. Her areas of expertise include climate change adaptation, social vulnerability, disaster risk reduction, livelihoods of rural poor and environmental migration. She has previous experiences with organizations such as the Rural Support Program in Pakistan, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, the United Nations University and more. With Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan, Humera oversees projects and programs that are related to climate resilience as well as adaptation capacity building initiatives. 
and Humera is going to be discussing the success, challenges, and opportunities in achieving gender-inclusive climate resilience in Afghanistan. Our next speaker will be Angie Daze, who is the lead of gender inequality and social inclusion with IASD's Resilience Program. Angie's work focuses on policies and practices related to climate change adaptation, resilience, gender, sorry, gender equality and social inclusion. This includes the analysis, guidance, and technical support for the National Adaptation Plan processes carried out through the NAP Global Network. And in addition, she leads research projects exploring gender dimensions of climate change adaptation in different contexts. Um, and Angie is recognized for her work. Um, she was included in the A Political's 100 Most Influential People in Gender Policy uh, in 2021. And we also have joining us today, um, Jenna Gami, who is the Director of Forest Trends Water Initiative which aims to scale up nature-based solutions for water security and climate resilience. Jen is originally from Hawaii, but she now lives in Peru, where she leads the Natural Infrastructure for Water Security Project. This project, which is funded by USAID as well as the Government of Canada, has served to strengthen water-related policy, knowledge, and tools while developing a portfolio representing over 300 million in new investments into nature-based solutions. And this work is being done in collaboration with national, regional, and local governments, as well as water utilities and the private sector. Uh, Gina holds a master's in environmental policy from the London School of Economics, as well as a BA in political science from Loyola uh, Marymount University in Los Angeles. And with that, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce you first to Humera Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anya. And uh, hello to everyone. Good evening and good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> so um, I welcome you to my case study which is uh, about uh, Afghanistan. And we will be discussing success and challenges and opportunities in, in, in achieving gender inclusive climate resilience in AKF Afghanistan. And uh, I will present my case study in the following uh, order that I will be discussing climate change and gender inclusion in Afghanistan, the state of art. And then I'll go into case study of uh, a European um, Mm, European Commission funded climate change project and how we are achieving uh, gender inclusions, what are the challenges and how uh, these uh, there are some success stories that will be also shared with you. And lastly, I will look into the opportunities and future outlook for achieving gender responsive climate resilience. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, in this slide, if you could see that uh, uh, the, the slide is about climate change in Afghanistan, uh, not this one, the next one. Yes. So uh, actually, um, Afghanistan is among the countries that have least contribution to the global warming, yet it is facing this uh, proportional climate impact that is affecting life and livelihoods of millions of vulnerable people. Afghanistan is prone to climate-related disasters such as flooding, drought, landslides, and avalanches. In addition to increasing climate-related risk, over three decades of conflicts coupled with environmental degradation and insufficient investment in disaster risk reduction, um, Afghan people are facing a lot of problems and they are uh, coping with the shocks of natural disaster in addition. So uh, what it is impacting is that there are uh, increasing uh, uh, rainfall variabilities, droughts and floods, and also trans international transboundary river basin of Amutaria, which is the major source of livelihood for the people, will be uh, uh, facing severe water scarcity affecting agriculture and food uh, security. People who are 80% dependent on 80% um, of the population depending on agriculture for their livelihoods, you can imagine how it would be impacting and affecting th that population. According to the projections of, uh, of, uh, by IPCC, there will be increase in more increase in temperature and more variability in rainfall. 
So therefore, our situation is quite alarming as, the, as far as climate change is concerned. However, when I was asked to talk about uh, women inclusive uh, climate resilience uh, uh, responses, I was a bit um, in confusion what to talk about inclusion or should I say exclusion in Afghanistan. So the situation is that uh, Afghanistan is the only country in the world, uh, next slide please, uh, where um, world is, uh, uh, where um, women are prohibited of, of even attending secondary education. So it's not inclusive <laughs> at all, it is rather exclusion. Two million girls aged between 10 to 14 are affected by secondary school closure and 1.8 million girls aged 15 to 19 are being affected. And um, if you go into the re uh, recent uh, data, there are restrictions uh, on women access to economic opportunities, which um, it's, very, it's very obvious. Uh, also, when we are working in Afghanistan with women, female labor force participation has decreased by 16% between last August and uh, October 2021. And women are among the most severely affected, uh, as you know, in climate change because they are at the forefront of all the, the effect. Since they are fetching water, they are uh, fetching uh, firewood from the forest, they are collecting resources for heating and cooking. So as you can you know, well imagine that the population which is most affected is most excluded. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, everyone who is working in climate change would know that how uh, important it is for any country to have this link where you can not only work at the grassroots level, but also you are part of international uh, climate uh, negotiations and climate uh, movement and all these climate activities going on in, uh, at global level. And unfortunately, Afghanistan is in isolation and we have uh, like a climate agenda globally and there is a huge gap because Afghanistan is a state in fragility and population is at high risk. There is non-existence of financial and political channels for Afghanistan to engage in international climate negotiation, which is very, very unfortunate. Whatever we do at the grassroots level, if we do not have a global or international support, then it's like really uh, challenging and frustrating for the people who are working at the grassroots level, like AKF Afghanistan. There is lack of national level engagement with international level in initiative, and that's a really like serious gap. Inability and limitation to scale up despite strong engagement with the grassroots level organization institutions of men and women. Like I already said, that whatever you do at grassroots level, if it does not have an impact or connection with the climate change global agenda, then it's really uh, not very encouraging. Afghanistan has significant data. For example, in our projects, we have produced vulnerability assessment reports, we have produced climate projections, we have produced climate models at river basin levels. Yet, we, there is a huge gap. We do not have further funding to continue downscaling the projections to be used at village level. Those data which we are community participated in collecting and giving it to the, to the project uh, technical partners now are at really in a difficult situation where, is, there is, where there is no continuous funding for that. And despite the challenges, AKF Afghanistan is still continuing to work with the communities and having strong and focus and commitment for the women inclusion in, in Afghanistan. So I would also uh, go to the next slide where I would discuss uh, the, in, uh, the challenges we are facing uh, for women inclusion in climate resilience responses. Uh, and I am not talking only about uh, the, uh, the women farmers, it is across, it's, it, it relates to our female staff which is working with us in Afghanistan, AKF Afghanistan, it's like implementation level at all levels, women are socially restricted, there is lack of mobility, women cannot travel from one, one district to another without mahram, mahram is actually one of the family members you have to accompany, it has to be either your husband, your brother, your son, and without mehram, you cannot even travel from one district to another. Women cannot attend government meetings even with a, with a proper hijab, with proper, you know, covering yourself with a scarf or 
having a long um, coat like uh, things you have to wear on, on top of your dresses. Women are disallowed from attending training sessions which are led by men and there is a huge uh, lack of education professional skill gap that, that is all coming up again now as a result of all these restrictions. And when you are talking about and we go to the field and we are working with the field and farmers, there is a lack of women ownership on land. So if you do certain activities with the women, then they have no ownership. And it's, it's a problem with which is associated numerous uh, benefits or, or economic benefits that could reach to women in otherwise situation. And of course, there is lack of women focused projects. Mostly projects are coming and then it's a difficulty for the project staff to include women because their, their women staff are not available to go and work with the women farmers. And lack of competencies and decision-making power is also a result of those legal restrictions because they cannot make their decisions. They, co they cannot have their control over their resources. In addition to that, financial and economic restrictions are also a um, problem for the women. And um, although these are, you know, like um, issues, but they are ground issues and we are facing these issues when we are planning and implementing all those initiatives for the women. We go to the next slide where uh, I will talk about global uh, climate actions and efforts. On one hand, we had the situation in Afghanistan, as I mentioned, on climate and gender. And on the other hand, there is a global climate action. We have sustainable development goal number 13, which is targeting number of issues. But in this restrictions, we are only able to work with three points, and that is strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity, improving education awareness raising, and then promoting mechanism for raising capacity of effective climate change related planning and management. So out of all these points, we have we are restricted to work only with few, and we are restricted to make or uh, contextualize our activities that we could include women in and this uh, effort to improve their situation. I will go to the next uh, slide and I will explain you how AKF Afghanistan is treating climate resilience and gender in their approaches to reach women. We are treating it as a cross-cutting theme to facilitate sustainable livelihood improvement for vulnerable groups, especially women and girls. And how we do it, we contribute towards social and economic empowerment of women in targeted provinces. We are not working in all the provinces, but we have certain provinces that we are working with because security and safeguarding of our staff and our women farmers are most important to us. And we are doing it through different activities in natural resource management, which is another name of nature-based solution. We are working in agriculture, forestry, and water. And uh, through these approaches, we are organizing community organization, women community organization, and we undertake dialogues with them. We do need assessment. We make adaptation plans. We prioritize the needs. And based on those activities, we are helping to ensure gender responsive participatory initiatives. And while we involve them in income generation, food security activity, we also are building in terms of uh, their climate resilience and their um, economic uh, empowerment by improving their decision making and ultimately the goal is to improve the quality of their lives. I'll go to the next slide and I will talk about uh, one of the project we are working in Afghanistan which is EU funded climate change project and we are uh, doing certain nature based solutions in uh, as I mentioned already in the water forest and agriculture we are also doing many other sectors, but I will take example of these three sectors and I'll uh, try to explain what we are doing in these uh, uh, three sectors. For example, we are working with irrigation channels and water pumps and reservoir for water harvesting. Although it seems uh, like activities which are mainly involved uh, men rather than women, but if you uh, closely examine how women are working in Afghanistan and what is their role, you would see that it has direct impact on women's life because they are the one who are fetching water, they are the one who are uh, working in the farms, who they are working for other water related um, uh, yeah, activities in their household. And that's where we see that they, this uh, working with irrigation channels and all these activities are actually contributing to raise the women um, uh, 
inclusion in those activities because on the other hand they are also um, uh, they are climate resilient activities because they are addressing water scarcity and water table problems and uh, agriculture food security problems and also water conservation activities in forestry we are doing industry raising we are doing plantation tree plantations and microforesting and these are all activities which are economically beneficial as as well as uh, biodiversity um, in, in conservation and improving soil fertility also increasing carbon uh, addressing carbon sequestration and uh, reducing dependency on land or for small land holding and in agriculture we are doing crop production we are introducing drought resistant varieties intercropping and fodder and vegetable production and the greenhouses and all these activities are addressing climate variability and rainfall variability as well because in our in uh, because since uh, afghanistan is um, afghanistan has uh, small land holdings and we are working in fragile ecosystem all these activities are um, uh, are uh, preparing communities to be resilient and to address these climate uh, challenges so in all these sectors if we go to the next slide we are uh, focusing women into a tailor made uh, um, activities we are um, um, taking care of their needs taking care of of the situation the context in which they are living Uh, the mobility issues they are facing different restrictions they are facing of not going out of their uh, villages or their premises or or closer to their um, uh, neighborhood so we are uh, developing activities for example poultry farming in poultry farming which is like not uh, is an activity which is not contributing to carbon emission as compared to the larger animals so it is not only uh, climate resilient but also contextually more beneficial for women and their economic benefit so uh, yeah. also I'm, pardon me to interrupt i'm just giving you a time flag would you be able to um move on to your concluding uh comments on it we just want to ensure we're leaving time for um the other two speakers sufficiently okay so just quickly these are some uh, photographs that i wanted to show where women are um involved in the activities which are uh, uh, designed for them to address those uh, challenges which which we are facing and including them in their um, in 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 the activities and making them economically benefit uh just uh, as a last slide if we go down uh, again to the uh, yes out of this very gloomy situation that we are facing we still have opportunities and future outlook for achieving gender responsive climate resilience because there is an increasing donor focus on women empowerment in afghanistan there are opportunities to improve their skills and at uh, organizational level and at community level women can attend training sessions which are led by women women are willing to work with organizations and ngo with proper hijab and and separate offices involving men in supporting women and family for better implementation is another strategy which strategy which we are working in and hopefully this will enable women to work freely however we need funding requirement for climate data generation and institutional hosting as akdn agency to downscale climate projections for community local communities and we need a lot of capacity development in nature based solutions for climate resilience for women and staff so you can ask uh, you can ask more question from uh, about this activities and i'll be happy to answer you and be more interactive in discussion session thank you very much Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Angie Daze, uh, and I'm going to be sharing a case study based on some work that the International Institute for Sustainable Development supported in Suriname through the National Adaptation Plan, or NAP, Global Network. Oh, can we get the slides up, please? 
So while we're getting them up, I'll just give you a quick intro to the NAP Global Network for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Uh, so this is a multi-donor initiative that was established in 2014. Um, we're really grateful to the Government of Canada, who has been a, a big supporter of the network over the last several years. And the Secretariat of the NAP Global Network is hosted by IISD. And we work through this network of adaptation practitioners and policymakers around the world to accelerate adaptation efforts through NAP processes. We provide demand-driven technical assistance for NAP processes. We bring decision makers together in peer learning processes. And we work to synthesize and share knowledge on NAP processes from our engagement with our government partners. NAPs are really an essential mechanism for making strategic investments in adaptation to climate change. They're going to help us in achieving the global goal on adaptation established in the Paris Agreement. And they're essential in achieving climate resilient development. So it's really important that these processes are effective and that they enable these strategic investments in adaptation. Um, and part of this, of course, is ensuring that they are gender responsive and that they yield equitable benefits. So to start into our, the context of Suriname, uh, the country submitted its NAP document to the UNFCCC in June 2020. And I think what's important to keep in mind when we're talking about these NAP documents is that they are just one milestone. The NAP process is an ongoing iterative process over time that involves planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation, learning. Um, I can control my slides uh, myself because we're jumping ahead here. Um, so these NAP documents are one milestone in this process and, and they tend to be relatively high level documents. So they establish priorities and they describe how they intend to implement these priorities. For example, what sorts of institutional arrangements they're putting in place for adaptation. Um, but they're important, so they're really important, but they're only part of the adaptation story in a particular country. So in Suriname's NAP document, they identified four high priority productive sectors, water resources, energy, forestry, and agriculture. And then they treat environment, disaster risk reduction, and spatial planning as cross-cutting themes. What's interesting about Suriname's NAP is that there is relatively strong integration of gender issues. They have a specific strategic priority to reduce gender and social inequalities through their adaptation efforts. And they've also got gender issues woven sort of throughout the, the other activities and objectives. So the NAP document identifies sort of higher level objectives and outcomes for the water resources sector, but it doesn't go into a lot of detail about how those will be achieved. There was a joint initiative of the um, Engender Project, which is partially funded by Canada, and the Global Climate Change Alliance Project uh, supported. These two projects came together to support the government of Suriname to develop an adaptation strategy and action plan for the water resources sector. And the NAP Global Network was engaged to provide technical support, and we worked closely with a local consultant in Suriname and also with the UNDP office there as they lead the Engender project. So basically, the process was about unpacking the priorities for the water resources sector that were identified in the NAP and explicitly applying a gender lens to that unpacking process. And I need to say up front that there was a less explicit focus on biodiversity in this process. So we really need to think about this as a case study of potential for nature-based climate solutions um, rather than a success story of, of MBCS that have already been implemented. So just a quick overview of the issues that are important for uh, adaptation in the water resources sector in Suriname. Um, though a relatively high proportion of the population have access to piped water, analysis found that 5 to 21 percent of the population reported that they were unable to secure sufficient drinking water, um, and this varies across the country. It's an interesting context because the population is really concentrated in the coastal zones and then the, the inland is, is sparsely populated in, in sort of rural communities. So we see stark differences in access to services between the, the coastal zone and, and the inland communities. 
when we look at climate risks facing the water sector, we've got droughts, flooding, and sea level rise, which unsurprisingly affect both water quality and water availability. And these risks intersect with other risks, for example, industrial pollution. They do have data on gender roles in relation to water, but there isn't really a strong ten trend there. There's a lot of variability between both regions and ethnic groups in terms of, of the way that gender roles play out in the sector. Um, they do have also some analysis where they've observed gender differentiated impacts of climate change. For example, there was an observation that women's care burden often increased in times of crisis that affect water resources. And on governance, there isn't specific data on water government structures, but looking at what the data that is available, it shows that women are underrepresented basically at all levels of decision making, so we can assume that that also applies in the water resources sector. So as I mentioned, this is an example about potential for nature-based climate solutions, but I wanted to highlight a few of the entry points that exist in this sector adaptation strategy and action plan. So the first piece is that it's really grounded in vulnerability and risk assessments for water resources, and there's a commitment to incorporate local knowledge and use a participatory approach, and part of this is looking at interdependencies between different um, water resources. And so that provides an opportunity to look at more sort of catchment level um, <clears throat> planning and action around water resources. The government has committed to an integrated water resources management approach, across, so this will apply across different activities and institutions. So again, this offers opportunity for looking at sort of conservation and, and catchment level um, management. The plan emphasizes data and information management to monitor water resources over time, so this can include sort of biodiversity indicators um, that can lead to better implementation of MBCS. And I mean, overall, the plan is about protecting water resources against climate change and other threats such as industrial pollution, so clearly MBCS are an effective way to reach this goal. I also wanted to highlight some of the aspects of the plan that address the gender dimension. Um, so across all of the research and analysis activities, including like the vulnerability and risk assessments, there's a commitment to collecting disaggregated data and conducting gender analysis. All of the project teams and decision-making mechanisms around the implementation of the plan are intended to be gender balanced. There is a commitment to equitable access to information, training, and employment opportunities that come out of the implementation of the investments in adaptation in the water resources sector. They are intending to involve gender experts across all activities, and there's an aim to have gender equitable and inclusive participation um, across the design and implementation of, of different uh, activities as well as in the governance structures for water resource management. So I'll just close with a few observations um, that may be useful to take away from this case example. Um, the first is that sector-based planning for climate change adaptation is really practical, not least because that's often how governments are organized in terms of the institutions, but it may lead to some missed opportunities to integrate cross-cutting elements like nature-based climate solutions. The second is that I think we need to be really aware of the layers of complexity that we're dealing with when we're trying to integrate gender equality, biodiversity positive approaches, and managing climate risks. And we need to have some flexibility and allow for some learning by doing as we sort of figure some of these tricky issues out. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, NAPs and even a sector adaptation plan at the national level are relatively high levels, so there's a lot of opportunities to integrate nature-based solutions as the details of implementation are elaborated. I probably don't have to say this to this group, but process is really important, so having a diversity of stakeholders involved really helps to ensure that direct, the priorities are directed towards equitable outcomes and that there's ownership of plans. And lastly, that this, having this very explicit gender lens applied throughout the entire plan sort of helps to avoid some of the big assumptions and make it really practical for the actors in the water resources sector to take forward. And that's all. Thank you very much.
Hi there. I, I'm Jenna Gammy from Force Trends. I suppose I'll jump in here. I'm not sure if you all have my slides to share or if I should share. There they are. Okay, many thanks. And thank you for the invitation. It's um, I'm joining from Lima, Peru, where we have been implementing the Natural Infrastructure for Water Security Project um, with support from the Government of Canada and from USAID, uh, building on uh, many years of work in Peru to kind of figure out how to use nature-based solutions to address uh, you know, water risks and uh, to build climate resilience um, and really trying to move beyond uh, kind of the pilot or specific projects to something that's really scaling at a national level. Um, and really thanks to the collaboration with Canada and, and thinking through how to take a feminist approach to this work from the beginning of the project. Uh, we've also integrated a, a pretty strong cross-cutting strategy uh, to think about uh, gender equality in nature-based solutions and how to tackle that challenge systemically. So I'm excited to share this and it's been really exciting also to listen to the other cases um, presented in the session. So let's go ahead. Um, I wanted to first just kind of give a little bit of context about this background in Peru and sort of before our project started in 2018. Go ahead. Um, so Peru has really emerged as a leader in nature-based solutions uh, for water uh, security, specifically starting about uh, and, and with leadership from different sectors. So starting about 10 years ago, uh, there was a policy decision to require all water utilities in the country to start uh, setting aside funding from water tariffs collected from water users for watershed conservation, ecosystem services. Around the same time, the Ministry of Environment and Ministry of Economy and Finance uh, passed new guidelines that allowed the national public investment system to recognize nature as infrastructure. And that started what we see in this graph, a whole bunch of new public investment coming in to fund nature, not only for the traditional biodiversity conservation goals, but also because it's seen as infrastructure that is providing services uh, like water regulation and soil control that's important for managing risks uh, locally and also further downstream. So there's this kind of new way of thinking about investing in nature that aligns obviously with the way that we think about nature-based climate solutions. Um, and um, there were also some important policy measures implemented after a series of really significant um, floods and landslides that hit the Peruvian coast in 2017 to include nature-based solutions or natural infrastructure as part of the plans to rebuild after those climate disasters in order to increase resilience. So a lot of great policy uh, leadership, great you know, visionary leaders, and even some really important financial commitments to begin to include nature-based solutions as part of these different strategies, both at the national and regional and local levels to address water risks and, and climate risks. Also, nature-based solutions are included in several measures in the, in the National Adaptation Plan in Peru. Go ahead. Um, and Peru was also an early leader on thinking about gender equality and climate change. In 2014, they launched an action plan on gender and climate change, which is a beautiful plan that includes a, a number of different aspects and really thinks about this in an integrated way. Um, a number of cooperation partners, including, I believe, Canada, supported uh, that plan early on. Go ahead. Um, but... As I'm sure you all are very familiar, having these beautiful policies and plans is not the same as seeing them implemented in the ground. And that's really where our project has come in to try to think about how do we make these beautiful visions into actually reality on the ground and what are the bottlenecks and challenges in getting there. Um, so one of the things that we did in the first couple of years of the project, we worked on a national study to try to better understand uh, gender gaps in natural water, natural infrastructure and water management. Management. Um, and that study found, on one hand, that both men and women play, obviously, key roles in managing natural infrastructure and water, so they are both contributing, even with inequalities that exist in the way that work is distributed and valued at the local level. Um, it's clear that 
the ways that we manage natural infrastructure, especially in the Andes, this includes a lot of uh, local knowledge and practices, water harvesting practices that kind of combine traditional knowledge and ecosystem management. Um, both women and men play key and differentiated roles. So we know that they have key knowledge and contributions to make, and that women are increasingly assuming more of these roles. So in the graph in that middle part on the bottom, it shows kind of a change between the 90s and 2012 in terms of um, who's controlling agricultural uh, land and production by gender, as women are, are taking on an increasing share of that role as uh, honestly, uh, largely due to kind of social transformation, transformations driven in part by uh, climate change, men are tending to migrate more towards cities and women are then assuming more of these roles in rural areas. Um, so women play a really important role in nature-based solutions and in water management. Next slide. But as we have know in other places and as we found in this study, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, they are consistently underrepresented in basically all of the decision-making spaces uh, for water management. So this graph shows in the blue bars uh, representation of men and orange bars representation of women by percentage in different um, dis key decision-making areas for water management at the national, regional, and local level. And in general, uh, women participation doesn't go above 30 percent in most places in most of these spaces, it's far below that. Um, and so when we think about why is that the case, we also need to recognize kind of these structural challenges uh, that are preventing active and, and, you know, and, and full participation of women in decision making on, on water management and on natural infrastructure, including uh, how rights are assigned for uh, land tenure and water resources, um, the share of domestic work, time poverty and pay equity, formal education gaps, and gender-based violence. Okay, I'll move a little bit more quickly. Thanks for the time reminder. So what have we done under the Natural Infrastructure for Water Security Project in Peru to address this? Go ahead. Just a quick, so our project started in December 2017. We closed in June of next year. And our purpose is to scale up gender sensitive investments in natural infrastructure in Peru as a strategy to regulate water supply and increase resilience to climate change. Uh, we're funded by USAID and Canada. We do not, in general, directly implement the nature based solutions in the field, but we're working with government entities, with private companies, with water utilities, so that they can develop and mobilize investments with local communities that will be sustained and financed by those sources over time. And in, in that uh, context, we're developing a portfolio of over 300 million in investments that are starting to get to the field. Go ahead. So our gender strategy is cross-cutting and systemic. And when we thought about this, we decided to focus at three well, the way I'll talk about it today is in kind of three categories, with institutions, with investments, and with individuals. Go ahead. So with institutions, we started working with leaders, with the main institutions in water governance in the water sector. Uh, on one hand, the National Water Utility Regulators, SUNAS, and on the other hand, the National Water Authority, first to put on their agenda and secure institutional commitments that it's important for them to work on gender equality um, and to begin to uh, put in place institutional reforms. In 2021, SUNAS approved the first gender equality policy in the water sector which includes some really significant commitments that we're, started, we're supporting them to begin to implement. Um, Anna has also done institutional diagnostics that are helping to kind of generate similar gender action plans and movement in these institutions that previously were not acting on the gender gaps in their sector and we're really unaware of them. Um, and as part of that, there's some really interesting work, for example, with Anna, where they're now open to um, approving, for example, a new protocol to include a gender approach in the way that water use rights are allocated by the institution. So really significant changes in how these institutions are beginning to provide services to the public with a gender approach. Next slide, please. We also work with the Ministry of Environment, 
on helping to organize women's participation in climate uh, policy. So Minamli is a very participatory approach to guide the implementation of the Peru's NDCs and to continue kind of update those plans and policies. And we've helped, helped to create a national committee uh, formed by women's organizations across the country that are actively participating in that process. We also have collaborated with Minam and a couple of other uh, national ministries to develop guidance on how to mainstream gender, intercultural, and intergenerational approaches and how the NDC is designed and implemented in Peru. Next. On the investment side, so then these are still in kind of the policy and policy implementation and these institutional changes. Then we need actually clear guidance on how do we include a gender approach in the projects, in the investment cycles, uh, beginning with the diagnostic as had been, has been mentioned today, moving through to how to think about it uh, in terms of the, the characterization of the problem, the solutions, and then the actual implementation. And there are a lot of really tricky questions come up when we actually start to do that, and we're doing it in the context of a system that has its own rules, like the Peruvian public investment system. So we have a lot of learning about that, and we've been developing guidance um, based on our own experience supporting this portfolio of projects, and then also in coordination with SUNAS, the National Water Utility Regulator, um, so that they are providing guidance to water utilities on how, at a programmatic level, they should manage their nature-based solutions programs, which is what MERESE stands for there. Um, and we're developing case studies. So in our portfolio, in some of the projects, it has been more possible than in others to include a gender approach at a really deep level, depending on what stage the projects were at when we began to work with them, openness of the partners, and other kind of contextual variables that are outside of our control. Um, but as we've identified these particular projects where we feel they can be really ex you know, examples and important case studies to the field, we've developed them in that way and are moving to, in the next year, be in a position where we're able to actually share those case studies as practical examples to other practitioners who'll be applying um, the guidelines. Okay, I'll go ahead and finish. And just to mention, we've also worked with individual women leaders through a leadership program that is supporting uh, local and national leaders uh, to develop their leadership um, skills. And just the final slide on conclusions. So um, when we think about challenges, something that resonated with me from the other speakers is just um, that closing gender gaps in water and natural infrastructure management and generally thinking about nature-based climate solutions is happens not in a vacuum, obviously, but in a very complex system where there are already really significant cultural and structural um, gender inequalities. I'm sure you all know this, but I think that sometimes the uh, ambitions kind of are not necessarily taking into account really what a big uh, challenge this is to address um, the, the root causes of the inequalities. And some of the, in the project level or in the program level, we're not always able to directly include a gender approach if we aren't yet tackling those structural approaches. So because of that, we found that this kind of top-down and bottom-up approach has been super important, working with the institutions um, so that they understand why gender equality is important, um, and then moving it towards guidelines and into implementation, and really taking this learning by doing approach and supporting individuals and institutions through this process, which, which requires a lot of learning and transformation. I'll wrap it up there. I'll take over here. This is a pretty magical uh, kind of experience to be dealing with virtual and in-person speakers. Thank you very much to all the speakers, uh, Humera, Angie, and uh, Gemma, for your presentations. We've now got a few minutes for uh, Q&A. I should introduce myself as well. My name is Paul Gueripo. I am a KFC Senior Manager of Public Engagement. There have been a few questions that have come online, so I will start with those, um, at least one of them, and then we'll, after the Q&A we'll get into uh, breaks and then breakout groups actually, so I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, there are floor mics on either side of the chairs here, so if you're in the room and have questions, feel free to 
line up there. So my first question, uh, which came from the chat, uh, goes to Humera Daniel. Uh, it's a question about uh, irrigation channels and water pumps. So the question was, you talked about irrigation channels and water pumps. Can you tell us about the fuel costs uh, of the water pumps? What is the type of fuel being used and is it climate friendly? So I'll uh, ask our, our AV folks to do their magic and switch into Humera. Thanks. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I cannot be able to tell you exactly the cost and uh, because every uh, installation has its capacity and it depends on that capacity how much uh, fuel is used and how much it costs. However, important thing what we are doing is replacing these um, fuel uh, pumps with solar pumps. And we have tried it in a couple of provinces. It's a piloting um, replacement of uh, diesel pumps or fuel pumps into solar uh, water pumps. And uh, those um, piloting are so far are very successful. The engine, like the capacity is from uh, 5kW to 15kW. And there are certain villages that are getting benefit out of it. They have the certain catchment area. And uh, by experimenting those, uh, uh, those solar water uh, pumps, uh, we are quite uh, um, uh, convinced that it, it could be, you know, a really good source of, uh, you know, like replacement from uh, towards climate friendly options. However, as you know that while you uh, you are replacing those uh, uh, installation, you need funding, you need a support. And it's not um, like when the ideas are new, you generally need more uh, sort of um, uh, financial um, security. And that is what we are facing at the moment. It's just piloting, but hopefully we will be replacing it to make it more climate friendly. Okay. Thank you, Hamara. I, I could answer it. Uh, we've got a question for uh, Jenna now. Um, so the question was, the national policy mandating water utilities to fund nature-based solution is reminiscent of New York's drinking water source protection program. Are the utilities publicly or privately operated? And I think you may have answered in the chat, but maybe for the folks in the room. Sure. Uh, the utilities in Peru are publicly um, managed, regulated, and funded. Um, the New York kind of Catskills water utility experience has definitely been an inspiration, although the regulatory context is quite different here. All right. I'm not seeing a, a clamor of, of excited folks lining up uh, to the mics here in the room, so um, I'm happy to uh, break this and, um, and sort of give ourselves some extra time to, to network and, and have a, a quick five-minute break before we gather together in breakout groups um, that will include a few panelists and a few others. Um, so I will explain that uh, first. So um, I believe Angie will be moderating one of the breakout groups, which will just stay in the room here. Um, uh, myself uh, from AKFC, pour ceux et celles qui veulent participer en français, je me trouverai uh, dans la salle extérieure ici, uh, dans une des cercles uh, de chaises. Then a third group, we've got Hilary Claussen from the Equality Fund, raising her hand over there, who will also be out here. And then uh, uh, Alec Crawford will, uh, I think, probably be um, maybe roving around a little bit, but uh, available to participate in a breakout group. Um, and then uh, on Zoom, uh, for those participating in Zoom, you'll be invited to join a breakout group virtually. Um, you'll have, I think, four options. Encore une fois, pour ceux et celles qui veulent participer en français, Catherine Burge de ISD sera disponible dans groupe numéro un. Then in group two, we'll have Naomi Johnson from C4D, the Canadian Coalition for Climate Change and Development. Group three moderating will have Humera Daniel, uh, climate change specialist at Aga Khan Foundation. And then in group four, we'll have Anika Turton, who is a senior policy advisor at ISD. So for now, we'll, uh, we'll break for a few minutes, but reconvene in our breakout groups at uh, 10 after, so 12.10. Um, and, uh, and then we'll uh, get together. Those who are on Zoom, you are welcome to join um, 
immediately and feel free to use these extra minutes to uh, become acquainted with one another and uh, network a bit virtually. Thank you very much and talk soon. Sorry. <laughs> okay, welcome back everyone. And uh, thanks to our online participants as well uh, for being patient while we try to arrange ourselves to come back into plenary. Um, now we're reaching the portion of the agenda where we're going to go into the report back and we'll hear from each of the moderators um, on some of the key uh, highlights, one or two um, key highlights that can address any of the three discussion points that we raised um, on uh, challenges, on data needs and on best practices. Um, so because this is hybrid, we can take advantage of trying to you know, have a little bit of uh, um, variety in, in the way we report back. So maybe we can alternate virtual and we can alternate with in-person. Um, so for each, each moderator, you'll have about three minutes uh, to present. So we just ask you to try to keep that in mind and uh, we'll have people here um, keeping time for us as well. So let's start with, um, with Naomi Johnson from the virtual group. Um, could you please highlight um, one or two key messages that came from your breakout group? Sure, hello everyone, thank you. Um, I think, you know, when we started to talk about challenges, we just recognized that it is difficult even to talk about, to generalize challenges when you have, um, you know, different sectors and different communities with such different contexts and different needs and challenges. So we just wanted to, I think, flag that. Um, there's, uh, we talked about really the need for um, just the, the issue of intersectionality, right? That makes things uh, difficult. Some of the speakers talked about um, with other, you know, really having to factor in social structures, poverty levels, education levels, all of these things, of course, influence the ability to achieve gender responsive results. And um, in many cases, you almost need their partners to help or uh, fill in some of those gaps, right? Because it is difficult to focus on nature-based climate solutions and the results you want to see in that and actually do gender uh, responsive work effectively. So to just make sure there are people almost um, uh, assigned or, or others who, or, who, are ability, who have the ability to fill those needs. Um, we talked about time, of course. You need long-term uh, projects to do this kind of work. Um, maybe uh, there was lots we talked about on data as well, but really just the point that it has to be relevant. And of course it matters who's getting the data and where it's coming from and how they're calculating it. And of course it would vary it very much from villages and context. So to think about those aspects as well and, and how we talked about how do we get that community and groups involved and local government groups involved to help address some of those issues. Uh, maybe just lastly to say, we kind of just got to best practices that we, we crossed a lot of it in some of our other discussion, but I think just the, the point about uh, having grassroots uh, solutions to these was, was critical, that it, these can't be top-down approaches. You really need to have um, local level communities involved. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, perhaps now I could ask Paul, since he's already standing, uh, please you know, go to the mic and, uh, and, and provide a few points, or up here. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm reading notes that I've taken in French, uh, translating live. But um, yeah, it, it was a really interesting discussion. I think uh, so, some of the points that Naomi mentioned uh, came up as well. Um, some things that sort of stood out was, uh, you know, working, working on ways to be more proactive in including women in the value chain, uh, providing access to, uh, to different types of training. In an agricultural context, we had an example from Soko de Vie. They've got uh, uh, what they call Chandical. Um, and then on the indicators points, uh, 
Uh, we had a few different examples uh, um, uh, with regards to measuring participation in economy and establishing uh, certain quotas for, for uh, uh, participation across different genders. Um, also the question came up around the different value of indicators and that indicators that we may be looking for um, may not actually resonate uh, with folks in the community. So it's, it's important to uh, actually be collaborative and, and participatory, not only in, in designing programs, but also identifying the indicators. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thanks very much for that quick summary, Paul. Uh, moving online, uh, maybe we could have a few reflections from Humara's group. Um, Veronica, I've been asked to do report back, or I am doing a report back for our group. Um, I think our, our discussion was really rich and, and, and very interesting. I think a few of the um, key points that came back was first, really understanding the context in which you're operating and thinking about what the best approach is for that situation. Uh, within our group, we had almost the two extremes of um, the Peruvian example we discussed looking at a project that was working closely with government and a government who has an interest in advancing um, gender responsive approaches within that context to looking at the um, Afghan situation where um, it's, it really needs to be prioritized. Um, the priority needs to be put on safeguarding and security first and foremost, so that all the initiatives that were occurring or are occurring within that context, um, first and foremost have to say, is this something safe that's not going to jeopardize the security of, of women in that? Um, yet, even within um, that context, so much can still be done. And the key point there was really being able to look at what the priorities were of local communities, of women within those communities, being able to understand um, what was feasible, um, what was safe to do, and trying to work within that space. Um, and I think a second point that, that came out that was very interesting was just the emphasis on the need to break down silos of not approaching projects from you know, an environmental perspective or a gender perspective, but really looking at how we can um, bring different priorities together, how these interrelate um, and are interconnected. Uh, when we started talking about data collection, this really came forth. Um, Jenna had a, a fabulous example from Peru about some of the data that they were collecting. Um, they were looking at project around malnutrition, or data, sorry, around malnutrition in communities. Uh, and from that data, the objective was actually to say, how can we use these water projects to address issues of malnutrition? Um, so sometimes extending that data collection beyond the scope of what you may first think um, is required or necessary, really looking at um, how to address intersecting um, issues. Um, and um, also, that raises an issue, I think, of, of capacity building, of what is required to ensure um, the people who are collecting that data understand um, the need for gender disaggregated data or have an awareness of, of gender issues and why it is relevant to the program, but also around um, the need to um, have policies and regulations that support um, data collection, uh, that this is, is, it needs to be mandated in a lot of cases. And um, in this case, it was helpful to have government participation um, and be working with utilities where um, and different groups where this could be mandated and, and supported. So I think those are, are um, some of the key points that were raised in our group. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for, uh, for that, Anya and Humara. Uh, so going back to in person, uh, maybe we can have Hillary um, come up and provide a few reflections. Thank you. Anyone? Great. Our group had a very dynamic discussion as well. Like Naomi's group on challenges, we started off with timelines. So if we're really serious about tackling root causes like gender norms, lack of education, you need a, a long runway. We also talked about the extent to which these big terms like gender equality and nature-based solutions are imposed by the donor or from the West, and if they're understood differently in local contexts and how to how to honor that local understanding. 
relatedly thinking about the, the scope of nature-based solutions projects. So if one barrier is women don't have the time to participate in nature-based solutions or to benefit from nature-based solutions, um, do nature-based solutions projects have to include ways to reduce that time burden? So um, providing care services, for example. That leads me to one of our best practices, which like Anya's group was that projects must be multi-sectoral. So they could include things like education and women's economic empowerment. In terms of gender disaggregation, we talked about how uh, data should be disaggregated in, in many different ways. So that intersectionality piece, particularly uh, class and age came up. And finally, uh, qualitative as well as quantitative data. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so Annie, can you provide a few reflections please yes. from your breakout group? Thank you. Um, thanks everyone, nice to see you. I just want to quickly say we had a great group. We um, navigated a little bit between English and French, so we didn't get to all of the things, but we had still a very rich conversation. Um, one of the things I think I would like to add to a lot of many of the things that have already been mentioned is that we talked about um, monitoring and evaluation, that it would actually be helpful to have guidance around a companion of uh, indicators that um, project implementers could use that could help to guide gender disaggregated data and how to develop frameworks that um, actually give us information about who benefits from our from our interventions and are actually the beneficiaries benefiting that we are identifying in the projects. Um, and then we, we also talked about silos. Um, I, what stood out to me as well is there is a lot more opportunity and space to share learning and to bring practitioners together and how do we make projects more gender responsive. We're working with experts that are focused on adaptation, biodiversity, development, humanitarian inter interventions. Um, and the, the last thing I want to say that really uh, stuck with me at the end is that what we're trying to do are really like generational interventions. And they require us to have more than two, three, or four years timelines for projects. And there's really an onus on us as practitioners also to make the case to funders and donors that some of these aspirations that we're trying to achieve need maybe something like a 10-year project. And that also allows for, for failures and, um, and for learning and just pushing for longer funding windows to, to achieve some of the very transformational goals that we're setting for ourselves. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Annie. Um, finally, maybe we can call Angie up here. Thanks, so we also had a really rich discussion and I think many of the points have been captured already. Certainly this disalignment of ambitions around gender responsive gender transformation, changing social norms, shifting power are not in line with project timelines. Um, but also the issue was raised that how we measure, uh, <laughs> to use a not very ideal word, gender transformation is also really unclear. And so it's not just about projects being too short, it's also us figuring out how we actually um, track the fact that these shifts have happened. And also the point about measuring, tracking unanticipated outcomes and where we haven't achieved what we hope to achieve and why is really important. Um, we talked about demystifying the terminology as well. I think that's really key. Um, on data, something that came up on our group that hasn't come out yet is the importance of working with sort of central government data systems. Um, and it was noted that there is a lot that can be learned from the health sector here in terms of coming up with standardized sort of data collection and, and health actors working with the government system and that setting up these kind of parallel systems is, is not actually helpful and, and not sustainable over time. Um, we did talk a lot about sort of local level and working with local institutions like women's rights organizations who are obviously there over the longer term beyond the life of projects um, and looking at the enabling environment, so working from bottom up, but also from top down. I think the, the importance of having sort of these enabling policies in place and working at these different levels is how we are ultimately going to achieve the sort of sy systemic changes that we're aiming for, both in relation to, to gender equality and to uh, enhancement of biodiversity. Thanks. 
Great, thank you very much uh, for everyone in their breakout groups and for the moderators as well for providing such um, excellent report facts. And it's clear, as with any event, that there's not enough time to go into all these discussions. Uh, but for that reason, our hosts have kindly left a whiteboard at the back. Um, there's two on either side, and if there's any remaining comments or questions or observations that you have, you know, you're more than welcome to go up and, you know, to, to note your observations down. Um, and also, if you're online, you can also uh, write in the chat box as well, and we'll keep a record of these. Um, I'd just like to hand over now to, uh, to our colleague Uju, who is going to make an announcement for lunch and, about, and describe a little bit about uh, um, session two. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think before I go on, i just like to welcome Alec Crawford from IASD to just give us some closing remarks. Sure. Thanks, Uju. Uh, I'm not going to touch the mic because I'm afraid of it uh, after what I've seen today. Uh, but uh, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, participating today. My name is Alec Crawford. I'm the Director of Nature for Resilience at ISD. Um, at ISD, and I think at many of the organizations that you represent, we recognize the fact that uh, you know, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, these are, these are the existential threats that we're faced with um, today in the world. And we see nature-based climate solutions as potentially one way of trying to uh, address both of those, a really promising way of doing that. But we're very aware of this. I think the conversations today made it very clear that unless those nature-based climate solutions are grounded in um, inequality and gender equality and social inclusion, uh, they're not going to be effective and they're not going to uh, be as sustainable as they would otherwise be. Um, there's really a, a foundational need to make these things, uh, again, gender, gender equal and, uh, and socially inclusive. It's, of course, very urgent, um, the, the action that needs to be taken, I think, from the breakout group discussion that I was in um, and from the other ones that I've heard report back on. Uh, there's an urgent need for us to get more case studies, to start experimenting, to start implementing things, and to continue to share uh, stories and experiences so that we can uh, continue to, to move towards, again, those uh, perhaps transformational nature-based climate solutions that we so desperately need right now. Uh, so today was a very rich discussion, hopefully um, just one of many in the future where more and more case studies are shared, uh, more and more experiences are shared between us, uh, and we can make some positive, uh, positive movements on both of these uh, very urgent crises. Uh, just a few thank yous uh, before we close. Uh, so again, echoing what Veronica said, a big thank you to the speakers and to the moderators uh, who helped us today. Uh, a big thank you to the organizing group that brought the, uh, brought the event together. I know it was no uh, small feat to do this, not only in person, but also uh, online. Uh, a thank you to all of you for joining us today, both in person and online. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to uh, the Aga Khan Foundation of Canada for uh, so nicely hosting us here in person, but also so expertly uh, pulling together a hybrid event that allowed us to uh, expand our reach to those who couldn't be with us in person. So a uh, big thank you on behalf of ISD uh, and, our, and our other partners. And um, yeah, looking forward to sharing lunch with you. But I think we have a few more uh, announcements before we fully close. So over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alec. Um, just before we end today's session, um, I think the team uh, at the back is going to assist me in pulling up um, a slide that contains a QR code. So we know, I know that we've had a very long conversation today. So please, we do welcome you to, you know, scan the QR code to share your feedback. Also to the participants online, we'll also be sharing the information in the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you of things that went well, things that didn't go well, things that could be going better, other topics that we could also be, uh, to be, could be conversing about. So please do so. Also, if you'd like to stay connected with all of our events here at AKFC, I also welcome you to scan the QR code um, to subscribe to our, our mailing list so that you stay tuned, stay in the know of everything that is happening. Um, so please, we'll leave this, the slide up for a bit. So if you, as you're going about, if you want to take some time to share those feedback, that would be really, really appreciated. Um, the next thing that we'll be going into is lunch. 
But before that, for our participants online, we're going to have a, a very simple but yet informative um, slideshow of videos from AKFC and IISD related to the work that we're doing, related to the work um, on, a, on NCAI by IISD as well. So that will be shared. We'll also open the breakout rooms virtually. So please feel free to you know, join the breakout room, network, exchange contacts, exchange more information, continue the conversations that were started. And to those who are in person, we do have lunch here that has been provided and also an opportunity for us to continue you know, conversing, engaging in dialogue. And then we'll be back here at 2 p.m. promptly to start session two, which will be hosted by um, Global Affairs Canada, which will be the community of practice. So with all of that being said, thank you once again. Uh, thank you for joining. Happy lunch, happy break, and I uh, hope to see you back for session two. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, to all of our guests who are still in the room, thank you so much for staying um, to session two and also those who are still with us online. Thank you so much for being with us. So um, I'm just gonna go over some quick housekeeping for this com community of practice session. Um, so we're going to be taking questions later on um, further on when we have group discussion. So once that happens, for those who are in person, um, the mics on the stands at the sides are already on. So you can just walk up to those microphones to ask your questions once we go into that session. To so all of the participants online, you're welcome to put your questions in the chat. Or if you feel like you'd like to also verbalize your question, you can um, use the raise your hand feature. And then once we see you, then we will call on you to ask your question um, directly. Um, our colleague Alana, who is online, will also be helping to facilitate the questions that will be coming in. And I will now present uh, or rather hand the mic over to Celine, who is the Director for Climate Finance Partnerships at GAC. Thank you. Hi again. Um, so we're going to put slides up in a moment, um, but I'll start already. So uh, what I'm doing is going to is providing some context for the community of practice. I won't touch these. I'll just stand this way. Um, so the context for the community of practice is uh, we're we're using the partnering for climate uh, initiative which is part of the $5.3 billion overall commitment um, as sort of a launching point to have this community of practice. Uh, the idea isn't that the community of practice is exclusively for partners within the Partnering for Climate envelope. Um, an important thing that I wanna say right off the start is that means that the people in this room are not, or the organizations represented in this room are not, uh, and, and online are not the, the um, the only ones who are going to be part of shaping this and, and creating this. Um, we, there we go. Um, we want to make sure that this is an inclusive uh, community of practice and we will need help. Uh, I think all of us using our networks to ensure that that's the case. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later as well. Um, so this was a slide that I had uh, up this morning and it was a little bit harder to see. So the part that I'm going to be focusing on with, with Carrie is uh, down in the blue section at the bottom. Um, one of the goals uh, is to learn by doing, um, uh, build capacity and knowledge of Canadian organizations, Indigenous peoples, and the government of Canada as well. Uh, we wanna create an en enabling environment in Canada and in the places where we're working for nature-based solutions to address the impacts of climate change in the longer term. Um, so, uh, on the Indigenous portion, just again, as a, a, for people's awareness, uh, we're working on developing a call for, for concept notes that, that hopefully you'll have uh, news about soon with uh, National Indigenous Organizations. Um, so we've been very focused on making sure that we get that going um, and that we've shaped that with them. So, so hopefully you'll have news on that soon. And uh, we're going to work with the National Indigenous Organizations also to um, get their views on on the community of practice um, and, and ensure their that we have their input. Uh, 
There we go. Um, so the origins of this community of practice. So Carrie and other members of the team uh, who, who are online but not here with us today um, worked on consultations and engagement back in 2020. Um, and there was a clear message that because this is a new area of, of engagement, it would be useful to have some kind of a community of practice for capacity building, for shared learning and support. Um, we know uh, and we heard many times today that, that there is a time challenge. We, we are very conscious of that. And so the idea of the community practice is also that it would be a chance to do real time learning and capacity building together as a group. Um, people have uh, different networks, but complementary networks and expertise. And we talked about silos in the morning and trying to break down those silos. So one of the, the the benefits of this community of practice would be to help make uh, make those connections. Um, and so what we're doing is is consulting and co-creating. We don't see this as a GAC directed community of practice. Um, the The vision for this is really that it's co-created and co-led um, by by various organizations. And we want to hear from you what would be useful, um, what the niche would be, what the added value would be, um, what what organizations in Canada in particular could bring to this kind of community practice. Um, and uh, the idea is organizations in Canada and partners of, uh, in where they are working. So that's the broad context. And I think I will now invite Carrie Max to come up uh, and work through some of the input that was received before and some of the ideas for what to do next. Thanks, Celine, and thank you. Um, it's actually a thrill to be seeing you not through a screen, um, and uh, it's also a thrill to see those of you through the screen. That's that's just continuing the thrill that the the Partnering for Climate journey has represented over the last couple of years. Um, what I wanted to try to do is is just set out some of the context and share more importantly, the background from what has already been some extensive uh, discussions with a lot of the stakeholders, a lot of the players out there that have a shared interest in whatever this community of practice might be. So starting with just something very basic, um, you know, what, what actually is it? Obviously, obviously we're coming together around a common share, a common shared objective of looking at nature-based climate solutions and how to do them well, how to understand them, and how to influence the practice. And that's that's quite often the side of the community of practice story that's left aside. It's This is actually to help inform the practice of nature-based climate solutions and maximize the impact, not just amongst ourselves, but internationally. And I'll come back to that because the input that's already been provided through the June event that uh, Veronica mentioned that IISD and Food Security Policy Group and C4D hosted and through uh, direct input from C4D. So one um, important uh, bit of information, both as an illustration of what a community practice is and as a, a signal to us in terms of how we as a group may want to position ourselves is when it comes to nature-based solutions, it already exists. Nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches, they are, they are identical, uh, they're, they're the identical concepts. Um, and as some of you have said in the conversation over the course of the day, this is not new, this is not a new area. It's new insofar as we're applying you know, a FIAP feminist lens, it's new insofar as we're applying nature-based solutions to climate. But uh, Friends of Ecosystem-Based Approaches already exists, and this could be a structure to inform how, how we want to come together. The big difference is FIBA is out there. It's heavily supported by the German government. And unfortunately, at this point in time, we cannot stand up here uh, and, and offer a commensurate set of resources. Um, what we're hoping to do is, as a result of this conversation, get a sense of what our options are. There may be a gold standard like FIBA, where if we can come up with resourcing options, we have some kind of formal well-resourced structure. There may be a, a bronze standard, which is essentially a mailing list, where we all come together and we share information and we make sure we're all informed, or there may be something in the middle. 
Um, the other real challenge here is given that FIBA exists, the question is, well, what is our value proposition? How can we make sure that a community of practice, if we move ahead with it, is unique and serves our needs and takes, advantages, uh, takes advantage of some of the opportunities unique to organizations here in Canada, uh, including, as, as Celine was mentioning, the, the vast experience and insight of Indigenous communities. Um, in terms of the work that they're doing, including partnering with, with public and private sector, um, and also the particular experiences of you in the room as you try to navigate this journey. Um, I wanted to share with you, and I realize this is actually, this is going to diminish the amount of time we have to discuss, but I think it's very important that you're all aware of what some of the things, what things have already been said. So in that June event, um, there was a very clear message. Be inclusive, accommodate all voices. Again, coming at this as Global Affairs Canada with a FIAP, that is at the heart of the Feminist International Assistance Policy. Um, we are absolutely committed to doing that. And we realize that we're just starting that process. All of those voices are not here in the room yet. So this is one of the areas where, as Celine was saying, we would really count on the collective experience and insights and networks of the people who are interested in becoming part of the community of practice to help inform how to do this and how to make sure these voices, if they choose to be at the table, are at the table. And then some of the areas of focus, uh, the stuff that's come up earlier today, food security, water sanitation, uh, urban, rights-based, there are some things that aren't in here, for example, you know, public-private partnerships or, or engaging with the private sector. But this is a, a quick snapshot of where people thought there might be benefits in terms of having working groups or subgroups or, or sort of key areas of, of importance to the community of practice. And then the question is, you know, what are the main objectives? And this looks very similar to the, the slide, what is a community of practice or to, to what, what FIBA does. Um, but I, I, I wanted to direct you to that third last bullet. Um, help develop a group of trained nature-based climate solutions practitioners to support organizations over time. Um, this, isn't, this isn't our bullet, uh, it's just one thing that's been said, but it does align with the messages that we seem to have been sharing amongst ourselves over the last two years, including as we've worked on the Partnering for Climate programming side, that there's an appetite in Canada and there's phenomenal expertise in, in the EBA world, in the food security world, in water, in, in One Health, in a lot of the areas that intersect with nature-based climate solutions. And what doesn't exist is pulling that all together into sort of a concept of, okay, how does this apply to climate adaptation with that climate focus? And it reflects a commitment that we had made at the outset in terms of the partnering for climate and the nature positive commitment of the government of Canada to try to build an enabling environment, to actually try to create a market in Canada of and for nature-based climate solutions expertise. So um, I find that one particularly interesting, but there are other elements in terms of the evidence building, the link with academic institutions, and I'm thrilled we've got Ottawa U, we've got um, Queen's, uh, students in the room and and hopefully more uh, online. Moving on, uh, as we pointed out, inclusion is incredibly important. These were some of the practical steps for both inclusion and for maximizing impact. Um, and again, we would we would turn to our collective networks and try to crowdsource in our insights and experiences to see how we should do this within the community of practice. But the other things are very practical. You know, maybe try to identify main topics and plan ahead a six month action plan, look at different opportunities, including one-on-one, -on -one, potentially mentoring, small groups, hybrid plus. And then I'll just focus on the annual meeting, a reminder that when we introduce this in, in our website, uh, introduction to partnering for climate in the previous conversations we've had with ACOC and C4D and KIDEP and Cooperation Canada, which were the groups that we used over the last two years to help inform our efforts to make partnering for climate 
as accessible and as practical as possible, notwithstanding the impossible policy imposition of a three and a half year timeline and all of the multiple achievements we have to try to achieve. Um, it, it's, it's clear that there was an appetite for doing this and uh, it's a, there's a possibility of, of using those organizations or using other organizations in here to step up. Um, but again, how do we make this as practical as possible? starting with the interests of the people in the community of practice, because if, if it's not useful to you, then it, it isn't worthwhile taking your scarce time and energy and, and investing in it. And then I also wanted to uh, share with you, C4D was kind enough to have a conversation amongst themselves, um, the Canadian Coalition for Climate and Development. I um, hope I got that right. Um, and, and they had indicated at, right at the outset that, look, we have to start, we have to get the job right in terms of inclusivity, and we have to make sure there's an enabling environment. And, and we're not gonna ignore the elephant in the room, resourcing, I've mentioned it. Um, we can't speak to resourcing right now. Um, sorry, by the way, these slides I assume will be circulated to everyone after the event. And this is not a one-stop, opportunity. We, I, I finish with an email address. We would invite all of you to share perspectives, criticisms, anything you want on our on our climate partnership uh, email address, because we'll continue to pull things together. Uh, I realize it's, it's hard to see. But getting that enabling environment, there's a suggestion of a steering committee. Um, but that point about capacity, um, having worked over the last 20 plus years in a number of communities of practice in Global Affairs Canada, the ones that succeed are ones that have dedicated resources and could be just human resources, uh, time, or it could be finance to, to lead and to convene and to pull together and report back, but also that are focused on an issue of shared interest. And when, when they're imposed from the top without that shared interest, they, they don't work. So um, the enabling environment will be key. And then, Maybe I do, did I move two? I missed two. Nope, that was two. Oh dear. There we go. And then you'll see a variety of different suggestions coming out of this last slide uh, in terms of roles and responsibilities, the, you know, what's going to happen. But where I was going before, which completely escaped me, was we have an opportunity during International Development Week which is held in February every year, to come together as a community of practice, both for a formal uh, you know, annual event where we would put our agenda and our lessons learned on the table. That will be an event where we hope as we roll out Partnering for Climate, the, the executing agencies who are running those projects will be able to share lessons, so very practical. We hope that other partners internationally, including IISD and IUCN, may be able to likewise put on the table certain things very practically that they think are important. And we're hoping, nobody can ever guarantee anything this far in advance, but we're hoping that our minister will be available to meet with the members of the community practice and listen to your views directly. So that's, that's sort of the, the flagship component of the community of practice, but we're open to anything and everything around that. And when I say we're open, I'll reiterate, I'm just sharing GAC's perspective. Um, this isn't a Global Affairs Canada owned or run community of practice. We're trying to throw out the idea. It's an idea that seems to have been consistent over the last two years and see where it goes from there. So that brings us to the objectives of our conversation. Um, which is assuming in February, we will have an opportunity to have the ministers here and the ear of senior, senior officials. Um, is there at this point in time, a set of issues that we would like to think about that should represent the first part of this community of practices areas of focus? Um, is that even an objective of the community of practice? Do we wanna keep it narrow uh, to just, sharing and capacity building, or do we want to, like friends of ecosystem-based approaches, see if we can actually influence policy and programming in Canada and internationally, uh, see if we can help support Southern voices as they, as they deal with these challenges. And then um, 
like I said, in terms of governance, logistics, uh, the approach to inclusivity, we're hoping to take on your, your inputs and the inputs that would come in through the email site to see what is what are the suggestions there. And then we would go back to you. We are going to be updating our Partnering for Climate website. Um, we'll be talking about the phase two of the programming side, You know the, the 21 full proposals that have been invited and, and the status there, but we'll also have a section on the community of practice. Um, it may simply contain links to, could be the NCAI website, it could be C4D to be determined, but we'll try to provide as much information as possible. And as I said, at a minimum, we can have an established mailing list so that we can get information uh, back and forth. So I just wanted to use that as the opportunity to set the stage. And I'm happy to listen to any comments, suggestions, um, Drew, I don't know if we have anything online. Not yet? Okay. If you'd like to make any suggestions or comments, feel free to uh, take the mic. Um, don't be shy. And, and even though we're all amongst friends, uh, a community of practice is a place, is a safe place to talk about not just the successes, but the challenges and the failures. And there will absolutely be on the agenda if we go forward during International Development Week a session where we talk about, okay, these are the things that we're having the biggest trouble with. And that's where we may have the advantage of being able to turn to ISD and IUCN uh, and, and say, okay, how have you helped deal with these, these hiccups? I'm not volunteering you. I realize that this is still a conversation that we have to have. <laughs> but question de clarification, perspective, opinion. Oh, it's that moment. Nobody online yet? Nothing? Maybe you just all want to go home. I don't know. <laughs> Absolument. Sure. I mean, I. I Je pense que the, the sections are still set up if we do want to come in, but but I guess we have now have two questions. So, avant de diviser. Hi, my name is Ellie Adelin. I'm with Austin Canada. I'm uh, we, we very much are um, we're part of Team 4D and appreciate you sharing so much for the community of practice. I'm wondering if Global Affairs is reflecting on other funding streams like women's voice and leadership under the community of practice and your thoughts there on how it's Thanks, Ellie. Do you, you can take more than one at it. No. So, in terms of other funding streams, there there are different communities of practice within global affairs. We've had conversations with some. We still have to have conversations with others, and we will do that with Women's Voice and Leadership. But one of the distinguishing features tended to be that they were restricted to members of the actual programming. I'm not sure if that's the case of Women's Voice and Leadership. As Celine said, that is not the intention here. Um, the call out on partnering for climate, the call out on nature positive climate action was a call out to all organizations in Canada and elsewhere who had a shared interest in this. And the, the vision for this community of practice was to have a forum that could help benefit them. But we will actually be following up. We'll be trying to look at best practice. We'll be having a conversation with FIBA um, and, and others, and we will try to reflect those in the input that we provide back. Uh, the assumption is that there would probably be another meeting, a virtual meeting between, there will definitely be another virtual meeting between now and February, where we can collate everything that we've received to date and share it with you. But also hopefully by then we may have had some organizations step forward and say, okay, well, we would be very keen on, on, on running this or co-hosting this. So, so that would be the plan. Is there an appetite for, for breaking out in groups so that this can be a more intimate, quiet conversation or, but, but s'il vous plaît? Uh, Arthur Perrin, Soko Devi. Uh, une petite question de, peut-être de clarification. Uh, Est-ce que, uh, en, en tout cas, il y a d'autres communautés de pratique, uh, C4D, FSPG, qui existent. Est-ce qu'on se retrouverait avec potentiellement les mêmes personnes? Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas des overlaps? Parce que je sais que ça, 
C'est aussi des charges de travail pour les organisations de participer, pour avoir des ressources, participer à ces, à ces, à ces, à ces groupes-là. Est-ce qu'on est que, est qu a quelque chose de très clairement identifié par rapport à, à, en termes d'objectifs par rapport à ces deux autres groupes qui existent ouais. Ça, c'est question. Bon, non, c'est une excellente question. Et, et c'est pareil à Friends of Ecosystem Based Approaches. S'il n'y a pas quelque chose qui est distinct de ces groupes qui, qui existent déjà, selon moi, ça ne vaut pas la peine de, de faire beaucoup sans avoir une un, un liste de courriels, un email list et, et avancer de telle manière. Mais ça, c'était l'objectif de cette session. C'était de partager avec vous. Euh, les grands enjeux et de vous demander s'il y avait un appétit, s'il y avait une valeur ajoutée. So the idea is, you know, if, if this isn't distinct from what C4D is doing or what um, the Food Security Policy Group is doing or what Cooperation Canada is doing, um, then, then it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Having thought through those questions in advance, I, I, I can say that we thought that the difference in this particular group is or could be that it was very much focused on the technical expertise of nature-based climate solutions, which is a very narrow, a narrow area, even though it, it touches on multi-sectors, and, and ha would have a very clear objective of trying to get all of us up to a higher level of understanding and creating an opportunity for us to share on this particular issue. But if that, for example, was an area that C4D thought warranted a standalone sort of subgroup, then that's how this community of practice would morph. Um, the one thing that this community practice doesn't currently have, because of course we have nothing, we don't have our objectives, is there's no policy influence side of it. And the advantage of having a separate community of practice was it wouldn't run into or contrary to the freedom that C4D or, F, or the Food Security Policy Group or Cooperation Canada or each of you have to basically heavily criticize the government of Canada and international development and, and do the policy advocacy work. Um, that could be part of this group. Um, there's nothing preventing us from engaging in it and we would be hoping to invite other government departments, people within Global Affairs Canada, public, private sector, um, and pending the conversations if there's an appetite with indigenous groups. So, uh, but I, I guess what I'm seeing in the room is, is It, it's still unclear what we would do. We're, we're, hesitate, we're hesitating to propose anything because this, is, this should really be co-created. Um, and in fact, I mean, it is one of the elements of success of a community practice that it's sort of a grassroots coming together, deciding what is our shared interest and how can we go forward. Um, if I was fortunate enough to have a million dollars where I could set up a secretariat and offer you something, I would do that. But I don't, um, I, we're just conveying the message that we seem to have been receiving From the outset, let's see if we can come together and create something that we could all learn together from. Um, so I'm just going to read a question that has coming on the chat online. So this is from Annie Turton at IISD. So she has expressed that she really appreciates the idea of this COP um, and feels that it will be really incredible and helpful. And FEBA is a very successful example. So her question is, How is this COP different and not duplicating FEBA? Is it going to be specifically Canadian organizations focused? Will it coincide along with NBCS projects being funded and implemented? Thank you. So as I was saying on the FEBA slide, um, one distinct element is Friends of Ecosystem-Based Approaches is ecosystem-based approaches for food security, for livelihoods, for gender equality, for One Health, for the triple nexus. Um, the distinction in terms of all of us participating in this space right now is we are talking about nature-based climate solutions. So that's an additional layer of complexity but it's also an additional layer of an opportunity to learn. Um, what is the subset of EBA or NBS that applies to climate and what can we learn from it? But it, it could be that FIBA actually has a climate focused group. Um, it's still one of the things that we need to explore. In terms of Canadian organizations, the clear message that came from Menti uh, and I believe C4D has been, we would really like to pull in Southern practitioners. And we would like to pull in other organizations, other donors, international, and take advantage of crowdsourcing that, that in, 
in terms of taking advantage of those. But I think the anchor is it is for organizations in Canada. Um, and I'm using that language very deliberately because an Indigenous organization is not a Canadian organization. So organizations in Canada and elsewhere in, in, in North America, that, that's a message that we'd received. It would definitely have privileged access to the lessons learned from Partnering for Climate. But it need not exist to get that, to get those lessons. Partnering for Climate, uh, Global Affairs Canada is very happy to use that International Development Week to simply set up an event, invite anyone who's interested and share lessons learned from our efforts and the efforts of our partners um, in this space if there isn't an appetite for something beyond it. Um, Okay, so I have another comment slash question in the chat. Um, and this is from Naomi Johnson with the Canadian Food Grains Bank. So her comment is perhaps it would be helpful to agree on some sort of steering committee committee or a smaller group specifically covering a diversity of groups and stakeholders that can begin to discuss some objectives to share to the broader sector for feedback. So her question is, could we agree on which networks or representatives would need to be part of that initial group with the understanding that it could change? Thank you. Well, I would put that back to the room. Certainly from our side, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the one other principle that I'd seen expressed was in addition to the groups that would want to be there, perhaps remain open to other groups that may not have self-identified yet as wanting to be there. But I, I think a steering committee, especially given how my stand-up routine is going this morning, this afternoon, uh, a steering committee makes sense. It looks like we need we need more guidance. We need something really tangible to sink our teeth into. And given that, comme tu as mentionné, il y a an overlap. There is so much of an overlap between the people in this room and those groups. Then I, I think there's probably some comfort in in giving them an opportunity to express their views. Sure. Uh, one other idea, I don't know if this would work, but I'm part of the global scaling and innovation scaling community of practice. You know, resource, this goes back to the resource challenge. So that's based out of Brookings, right? So they're very interested in the research side as well as there's the implementation side. So one option could be somehow trying to bring in universities, IDRC research. They can host these things and they have a lot of interest in actually, you know, the research that comes out of it, the evidence generation, that might be one way of dealing with the issue. Thank you. That's that's a really good suggestion. And I, I, I know that academic engagement was one of the areas that came out of the mentee. And it's certainly an area that Global Affairs Canada has tried to continue to promote. IDRC will definitely be you know, engaged on, on this particular issue. There are other universities, some in the room right now, that, that have areas of expertise. At a minimum, we were talking earlier today uh, we're thinking that some of the key challenges that come up, either from partnering for climate uh, proponents or from a community practice, if we have one, could help inform university professors in providing their master's students with uh, areas of investigation uh, for, the, the, we've, we've done a lot of that with programs before, sort of say, here are the key development questions we'd love to hear answered. Because the research side of this is also also important. One of the one of the messages that came out of another conversation was, we don't have the evidence that, for example, gender transformative nature based solutions leads to better outcomes when it comes to mangroves or forests. We assume they will, um, but we don't have that evidence yet. So there's a whole world of of developing evidence, of building research, of linking into research communities that could also be explored. I have no intention of keeping you here. If, if one of the options would be if uh, there's been a suggestion that if there's an appetite for a smaller group discussion, um, I would invite people for the time we have remaining in the, uh, in the, in the session to stay if you wish. Um, how do you want to manage the remaining time we've got? Are there closing remarks that anybody needed to make or will we? Okay, so before the bill comes up, I would just like to thank you all very much for the support you've given to date on this journey and whatever comes out of our efforts to create some kind of structure, whether, like I said, it's just a mailing list 
or it's something more formal that, that convenes once a year or more, uh, we continue to look forward to working with you on this. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, once again, for um, staying for this second session um, for our community of practice. Um, thank you so much for staying for the entire day, um, engaging in this conversation, for participating, for listening, for taking down ideas, for sharing your own ideas as well. I think there's been a lot of, um, you know, good and informative discussions that have come out of today's session. So we hope that we'll be able to continue this conversation. So following this event, we'll be sharing out more information um, on the handouts with key resources related to gender responsive nature-based climate solutions, with the, um, the presentations from session one and session two, and any other further resources that we'll have for you. And thank you guys so much once again for coming. Thank you to the IISD team for partnering with us in today's session. And we hope that you have a lovely weekend.